And this is one of my favorite texts in the Bibles. Acts 5 and verse 29, the Bible says, We ought to obey God rather than men. This is Peter. Peter makes it really simple. Peter's on trial here, by the way, in Acts chapter 5, because he was preaching about Jesus, who Jesus just told him, you go out and preach about me. But the leaders in Jerusalem said, no, no, don't you preach or we're going to put you in jail. And Peter stands up for his defense, and they're expecting him to give in to them. And he says, we ought to obey God rather than men. Isn't that wonderful? In fact, this is sort of a central theme within the Bible, isn't it? To obey God rather than man. Maybe we should take a little sidetrack now. If you have your Bibles, look right in the middle of your Bible. How many of you know where the very middle of your Bible is? Yeah, well, Psalm 118, isn't it? It's Psalm 118. Psalm 117 is the shortest uh, chapter in the Bible, and Psalm 119 is the longest. So right in between there, highlighted in between these two uh, notable chapters, is Psalm 118 and verse 8. Verse 8 is actually considered the very center of your Bible. Let's see if that has the, the central theme in, of the Bible is to obey God rather than men. And right there in the middle of the, of the Bible, what do you suppose it says here? Somebody want to read that? Yeah. It, it's better to, yeah. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. When comparing man's laws with God's laws, it's, whoa, it's way better. Amen. It's better to put your trust in God's law. God than man. So right there in the center of the Bible, you see the central theme. And in the, in the lesson, it says, Mark 7, 7, Jesus is speaking. He says, in, what's that next word? In, I lost you, didn't I? Oh, oh okay. Oh, Psalm, okay. And you know, another thing, interesting thing about Psalm 118, 8, uh, if you count before Psalm 118, there is 594 chapters Right afterwards, there's 594 chapters, and you add that together, it equals 1,188. Isn't that interesting? Which is, is 118 verse 8. It's the same numbers. And so this is really interesting. That's, that's what they say. In fact, Jackson was doing a little research for me. I said, you better check this out for me before I go out and preach this. But um, you can check it out and let me know if you come up with something different. But I think that the Lord has sort of highlighted this central theme in the Bible for a reason for seminars like this, because he wants us to know that it's important, it's a central theme of God's teaching, to obey God rather than, than man. And he's, he makes it a central theme in the Bible. Can man vote to change God's law? No. They can vote, huh? But can they do it, though? Can, will God go along with it? The Bible says in Malachi 3 and verse 6, you know this one, I am the Lord, I... Amen. I change not. Now, in your lesson, there's a little... Uh, a little segment about Protestant ministers who admit that the Bible doesn't support Sunday observance. Now, you're aware that the, the, the higher-ups, the theologians within Protestantism already know there is no scripture. Some of their, their members in their congregations don't seem to have a clue. They're not sure. But they, they, don't, they just know it's in there somewhere. Somewhere in there it says, henceforth ye shall keep Sunday. They think it's in there. But the higher-ups, the theologians, they know. And In fact, there's some quotes I've got a number of quotes. I could give you pages of them. I only listed about five of them here. For instance, the Baptist. It's from uh, Dr. E.T. Hiscock, the author of the Baptist Manual. He's the, this is Mr. Baptist here, basically. He says, the Sabbath was not Sunday. There is no scriptural evidence of the change of the Sabbath institution from the seventh to the first day of the week. Now, that's an interesting thing to say. Uh, then why, I wonder, why don't they just change? Can you think about it? Why would it be so hard for Sunday churches to change to Saturday, go back to the Sabbath? It doesn't really make a lot of sense. American Congregationalists, here's one thing from their writing, from Dr. Layman Abbott. He says, the current notion that Christ and his apostles substituted the first day for the seventh is absolutely without any authority in the New Testament. And you can go on and read what the Methodists say. Um, and the Presbyterians, and then from the Baptist manual, this is another Baptist publication called The Watchman, they say right there in their little publication, says the scriptures nowhere call the first day of the week the Sabbath. Yeah. And you think about it, why would God change his Sabbath? Was there anything wrong with the old Sabbath? There's absolutely nothing wrong. There's no reason to change the Sabbath. And like I said, I, we do have a number of quotes. We didn't publish them yet. I think we might 
publish them in a little handout, uh, all the, what the Protestants are saying, what the Protestant leaders are saying about the Sabbath, about the Sunday and Sabbath issue, because all of them are admitting, when the ones that know, they all admit, well, it's Saturday is the Sabbath, and there's no change in the New Testament. So we, we, and we keep the new one because uh, of tradition. They basically admit it's tradition that we keep Sunday. Qu- that le- question number seven. We better move along. Oh, in, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Mark 7, 7. In, in, that's right, because you guys, I lost you. Remember? I said, I said oh, where are you? I'm just waiting on you. In vain do they worship me, says Jesus, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. Oh, that was a, you don't want to miss that one. Jesus says to, to teach co- the doctrines and commandments of man is vain worship. Vain worship. And he says, don't do that. So question number seven. Is the mark of the beast a literal mark? As it, some people, remember we speculated last week, is it a barcode? Is it the, a chip? Is it a tattoo or a rubber stamp? Right, you know, 666 right in the forehead? Now that would make the devil happy, wouldn't it? Because he would divert you from what it really is. The mark is a sign of loyalty, is what it is. It's basically a sign of loyalty. Where is the mark anyway? We studied that in Revelation 13, verse 16. It said that, the, that he would cause all great, great and small, uh, rich and poor, all these people to receive a mark in their, yeah, their forehead or their hand, right? Their right hand or the forehead. And what's the meaning of the right hand and the forehead? Hand, right, okay, you already know this. So hand, the hand means is your works. And the forehead, this is where your thoughts are. Your thoughts and your actions. Yeah, what you do and what you think. What you believe and what's your, you know, your heart, your desires, and your deeds, your actions. So the forehead, thoughts, hand, actions. That's what it's really basically saying. In fact, it'll bear that out. The Bible bears this out pretty well. In Deuteronomy 6, in verse 6 and 8, in your lessons, the Bible says... These words which I command thee this, this day. Now, what words is Moses talking about? Yeah, in, in Deuteronomy 5, he, he recites, he rehearses, and repeats the law, the Ten Commandment law. And then in, verse, in chapter 6, he says, These words that I commanded you this day shall be in your, in your heart, or the heart. Now, that that's not, doesn't mean the ticker, does it? It means in your mind. This is, what the, this is what we call the heart. It's in your heart, your desires, your mind, or your thoughts. And then listen, then it goes on to talk about what this means. What does it mean to be in the heart, and in the desires, in the mind, and the thoughts? Verse 8 says, You shall bind them for a sign, or a mark, or a sign, upon your hand. Yeah, that's the actions. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, or your thoughts. Where's, what's between the eyes here? This is the forehead, isn't it? So it's actions and deeds. So the mark is a, is, is a sign of loyalty, in the forehead, and obedience in the hand. Does that make sense? Not a tattoo, but a sign. Right. Yeah, that's your frontal lobe, isn't it? So those of you who know anatomy, this is, this is where, we, where we reason, isn't it? And where we make decisions, where we think. And morals and ethics are all in the frontal lobe. Yeah, this is, this is, this is where God communicates with us, right here, between the eyes. Frontlets between your eyes. I think in your lesson we've got a few other texts, at least two or four other texts in there, that will bear out what the, what it, what the Bible is talking about when it talks about the hand and the forehead. So, question number eight. What does the papacy claim as their mark of authority? Now here they're going to identify, they're going to tell us what their mark is. Revelation 13 and verse 15 says, As many as would not worship, now there's that key word, Worship, the image of the beast, should be killed. They're going to force, this is, this is, and worship is the key issue here, isn't it? It's all about worship. It's not about tattoos. Because think about it, if it was a tattoo in your forehead, then all the devil would have to do is get some big guys to pin you down and tattoo you, wouldn't he? Then you're, you're lost. The mark of the beast. You're, you're done for. And, and, or if it's in the hand, he can just hold you down when you're not looking and just come up behind you and 666 you right there in the old hand. Wouldn't that be bad? Gotcha. Mark of the beast. You're lost. No, it's, this, is a, this is worship, and it's, it's a sign of loyalty, a sign of worship. Now listen here, from the Catholic record, London, Ontario, September 1, 1923, from their own writings, it says, Sunday is our what? Mark. Now this is wording right out of the Bible. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof 